Romans chapter number 8, please. Romans chapter 8, verse number 28 is where we'll take our text and read a few verses here, get into the message. Tonight is going to be a, a good deal of information. I'm setting the stage for something that we'll be dis, uh, going over the next few Sunday evenings. We've been in our study on why we believe in and why it's important. We've covered the resurrection. We covered the blood atonement. We covered uh, the virgin birth. We covered the King James Bible. We covered several different topics of why we believe something and why it's important that we believe it. Uh, tonight, I want to begin looking at something that is, uh, I guess you would call it controversial. It really shouldn't be controversial. I, I want to just say this before I say anything else. I am a Bible believer. I believe the Word of God. And I'm going to teach and preach the Word of God. Regardless of what name may be tagged to something or what name may not be tagged to something, I'm not going to shy away from something that the Bible teaches because it's got a name tagged to it. And I'm not going to believe something that the Bible doesn't teach because it's got a name tied to it. Amen. I'm going to be a Bible believer. And uh, tonight I want to start something. This is actually someone came to me when I began uh, this, this uh, topic, this study of why we believe and why it's important. Someone came to me and asked me to cover this topic. I by no, mean, no means am a scholar. I've never claimed to be, but I promise you this. I'm going to do my best to study, seek the Lord's face, and get as much information as I can. So tonight I'm going to be giving out some introduction to information. So don't let me lose you in that. There's some great truth that we'll get a hold of and some things you need to hear in order for us to bring this particular uh, next few messages as we deal with this. So stand together, Romans chapter number 8, verse number 28. Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings upon the reading of your word. I ask you, as I've already asked you, Lord, help me uh, not to say anything I shouldn't say. Lord, I pray that you would help me to give truth. I want to be known. I want to stand as a Bible believer. And Lord, I ask you that you would help us to deal with these subjects, Lord, uh, that, and to deal with them very tenderly, uh, Lord, from the depths of love that you've given us. The Lord, also help us to seek truth, that we may know and understand what the Bible teaches and what we ought to believe. I pray, Lord, that you would guard my lips. Lord, I ask you that you'd get glory and honor for yourself. Teach us from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Why we believe it, why it's important. This is my subject for the next few weeks, however long the Lord allows us to, to go through this. Calvinism, Arminianism, neither or both. That's going to be the title. If you want to write that down, that's what we're going to be discussing. I had someone come to me and ask me if I would teach um, about Calvinism and why we are not Calvinists. And I'll say that dogmatically and emphatically. We are not Calvinists. I am not a Calvinist and I do not believe Calvinists or Calvinism comes from biblical teaching. I also, with that, am not an Arminian. Uh, I do not believe the Bible teaches Arminianism either. So I'll go ahead and give you the answer. Calvinism, Arminianism, neither would be the right answer. Both is uh, what a lot of people have tried to end up with. They've tried to grab some Calvinism, tried to grab some Arminianism. Now, uh, I've also said this, I'm not a scholar and I don't, I don't claim to understand everything. Uh, there will be some that have a greater understanding of one or two of these subjects, and, uh, but, but I'm going to approach it as biblically as possible and try our best to come up with what the Bible teaches about the doctrine of salvation. Uh, such an important doctrine is it any wonder why Satan has tried to divide it among Christians? I mean, we're talking about the doctrine of salvation. We're talking about what we believe in regards to how a person comes to the saving faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Savior. That, I would say, is an important doctrine. That's a heaven or hell doctrine. If you are saved, you're going to heaven. If you're not saved, you're going to hell. You don't get out of hell just because you were sincere. 
Every Muslim that's ever strapped a bomb to his chest and walked into a park somewhere and pulled the trigger is sincere. You won't find anyone more sincere, but they woke up in hell. Screaming in anguish and pain. They did not go to heaven. And they didn't go to some place where seven virgins were waiting for them. They were mistaken. They were blinded. They died and went to hell without God. The man who crawls, and I've seen it in Mexico several times, the man who crawls with a cross on his shoulders. And his knees are bloody as he crawls through cobblestone streets and trying his best in penance to earn his way to the Lord. Guess what? He is very sincere. You don't, you don't rub blisters on your knees if you're not sincere in what you're doing. But that man, when he dies, he dies without the hope of Jesus Christ because the answer is not in his work and him making his way to Calvary. The answer is Christ who made a way for that man at Calvary. That is the answer. So this doctrine of salvation is a very important doctrine. No wonder it's been attacked and tried to be divided in so many different areas. And, um, I, and I like what one person said. If the dogs are barking at you from both sides of the road, you're probably about where you ought to be. Amen. If you've got Calvinists standing in the yard and they're barking at you over here and you've got Armenian dogs over here in the yard and they're barking at you, you're probably about where you ought to be in the middle of the road. Amen. And, and that's what I want to be. I don't want to get unbalanced. So let's deal with the names first. You'll hear this in regards. I couldn't find any other names from Arminianism except Arminianism. That's the most prevalent name. Somebody, some, some call it easy believism, but really if you study Arminianism, it's not uh, what we refer to as easy believism. Some refer to it as uh, losing your salvation. That's only one component of what Arminius believes. So really the only name that we can come up with to hold to would be the name of an Arminianist or an Arminianism. The names of Calvinism are a little bit different because you'll hear them uh, referred to in different ways, especially in today. Now, Calvinism started years ago, and John Calvin, born back in the 1500s, he was the founder, and that uh, and really goes beyond him as well to uh, Augustine, I believe it is. And, and so there's a lot of teachings coming out through that for years. So you got Calvinism, but then you'll hear this as you get into some circles and you study it. You'll hear the, the thought of Reformed theology, Reformed theology is simply just a, another facet of Calvinism. It's kind of a, a modern version, if you would, of what they call Reformed theology. And this is, this is from a Reformed theology uh, uh, website and, and books and things of that nature. They refer to Calvinism themselves as Calvinists as Reformed theologians. Also, you'll hear Reformed thought, and then you'll hear this, the doctrines of grace. And, and I believe in the doctrines of grace but not as taught in Reformed theology and in Calvinism. So be careful when you hear those things. If you hear someone talking about the doctrines of grace, more than likely you're dealing with someone who is either Calvinist, has some Calvinist leanings, or has been studying after some Calvinist men. I will say this, some of the most learned and, and educated men that I have read after, I'm talking about old Puritan writers, great, great men who, who knew a, a great deal they had a depth with the Lord, but they were off on this thing of Calvinism. They were off on it. And uh, many great, the Puritan writers, many of them were Calvinists and come out of that Reformed theology. So you've got Calvinism, Reformed theology, Reformed thought, the doctrines of grace, and you've got Arminianism. Let's notice the men for a moment. And then we'll get to the doctrines that each taught. The men, John Calvin, born in France in 1509, raised a devout Roman Catholic experienced a sudden conversion, he called it, a sudden and unexpected conversion somewhere around 1533. And uh, that was his salvation experience. He then became a prominent leader in the Protestant Reformation, uh, really taking the, the prominence uh, after Martin Luther died. John Calvin was one of the main leaders of the Protestant Reformation. He died in Geneva, Switzerland in 1563. The other man who founded the, the where we get Arminianism from is Jacobus Arminius. Uh, born in 1560, was a Dutch Reformed theologian and professor of theology at the University of Leiden. 
He was most noted for his departure from the Reformed theology of the Belgic Confession, resulting in what became the Calvinist-Arminian controversy addressed at the Synod of Dort in 1618 to 1619. What we're about to hear and what I'm about to teach you now in the doctrines that these believed and the doctrines they put forward came out of what I just mentioned, the Synod or Synod of Dort in 1618 to 1619. There was a controversy. You've got the Calvinist following John Calvin's teachings that go back even beyond John Calvin. You've got, uh, and, and then you've got this group of Dutch Calvinists that are branching off following Jacob, Jacobus, Jacobus, however you want to say that. Uh, we'll just call him Jake. Amen. Uh, make it easy for everybody. Jacobus Arminius. And, and they are following him. They are following him away from the Calvinists and they've come to a controversy. They've come, began to butt heads. Who's right? Who believes what? And in this sin of Dort, this is where they came up uh, with what we will be teaching a, a, as a basis for getting into it. First, we'll deal with Calvinism. Calvinism is most widely known and uh, most known for an acrostic, and most of you will know this, called the tulip, just like the flower, T-U-L-I-P. And uh, some you will hear talk about tiptoeing through the tulips and there's all kinds of derogatory statements about that and there's all sorts of positive statements depending on the circle that you are in and the people that you're talking to. The tulip really came from the Synod or Synod of Dort in 1618 to 1619. That's when they got together and they laid down five points of Calvinism that they were going to hold to and they were going to vote on it and this was going to be their belief and their doctrine of salvation. Salvation, and it goes like this. The first was the T. If you want to write this down, the tulip, you'll, you can write each one of these down. The T stands for total depravity. This is often mistaken to mean that humans are all hopelessly, intensely sinful, which now I understand, and, and I should have prefaced this. I want to make sure I'm getting this out right. What you will hear in each one of these doctrines, when we're dealing with Calvinism, we're dealing with Arminianism, you are going to hear things that sound right. You're going to hear a lot of things that sound right. We're not going to take them at face value. We're going to get down to the core of them so that we understand what are they actually teaching and are we or could we be called a Calvinist or an Arminian or simply are we Bible believers, which I believe we are. So as we go through this, you're going to say, well, that don't sound, that don't, that don't sound wrong. But as we go through this, you'll see some things that we need to pull out uh, to help our understanding. Total depravity. Are all men sinners? Absolutely. The Bible teaches that. Are they hopelessly lost? Absolutely. The Bible teaches that. And the total depravity, uh, it actually means something different in, the, in, in uh, Reformed theology. It means uh, as a result of Adam and Eve's disobedience to God, the fall of man, sin has extended to all parts of every person's being, his thinking, his emotions, and his will. Sometimes it has often been called total inability. This is a concept that is impossible for the ordinary natural human to understand the gospel message. They are spiritually helpless. First, God must uh, first decide to intervene in the form of the third personality within the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, the person is lost forever. That's total depravity or total inability. That's the T. U stands for unconditional election. This is the concept of predestination that God has divided humanity into two groups. One group is the elect and it includes all of those whom God has chosen to make knowledgeable about himself. The rest will remain ignorant of God and the gospel. They are damned and will spend eternity in hell without any hope of mercy or uh, and be in extreme tortures. God made this selection before the universe was created and thus before any humans existed, the ground or grounds that God uses to select the lucky few is unknown. What is known is that not through any good works on the part of the individual, it is not that he extends knowledge to some in order to find out who will accept salvation and who will not. He simply does not extend any mercy to one group of people. He extends mercy to one group of people. That's unconditional election. God simply chose some that were going to be saved and some that we're going to be lost. The L stands for limited atonement, ties very closely with the unconditional election. The limited atonement or particular redemption is, is mentioned sometimes. This is a belief that Jesus did not die for all sin. In other words, where the Bible said Jesus died for the sins of the world, that's not what the Bible meant. The Bible meant Jesus died for the sins of the elect. 
and that only the sins of the elect are atoned under the blood of Jesus Christ, and that is the, the only, one, only sins particularly that Christ died for. All other sins, because they were non-elect, Jesus did not die for them because there was no mercy extended toward them. Their thinking in this is simply, if Jesus died for all sin and then some do not believe and they go to hell without God, then, then there are people in hell for whom Christ died. And if there are people in hell for whom Christ died, then God is a failure. That's their thinking. Do you see, if any man lifts his eyes in hell, it's not God's fault. God has done everything he can to redeem that man. And he rejected Christ. He rejected salvation because Christ died for all sin and for all sinners. So the limited atonement teaches that Christ only died for the elect and only the, for the sins of the elect. Irresistible grace is the I. We've been through T-U-L. And now I, is, it stands for irresistible grace. This is a belief that every human whom God has elected will inevitably come to the knowledge of God. The elect can cannot resist the call of God. In other words, if you are elect, there's nothing you can do. You're going to be saved. You can live recklessly or whatever. And I know there will be those that say, but if they're elect, they won't live recklessly. And I don't have time to get into that argument. But the, the premise of this uh, irresistible grace is simply this. If you are elect, you will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, regardless whether you want to or not. If you are not elect, there's nothing you can do to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You are damned forever from the foundation of the world long before you were born. God had predestined that you were damned to go to hell. That's irresistible grace that everyone who is elect will accept the call of God. And then there's the perseverance of saints, which is the P, and this stands uh, for perseverance of saints. This is the once saved, always saved belief. I don't like the way they stated that, and I pulled some information off. And uh, it, it's not just the once saved, always saved belief. We are once saved, always saved. Once you're saved by the grace of God, hey, you're in. You're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you can't be taken out. You, you cannot be unborn. When you were born as a child, you were born. There's nothing you can do to be unborn. And when you're born as a child of God, you are born. You cannot be unborn by any means. You're saved. It doesn't mean you're right with God. It doesn't mean that you uh, won't necessarily sin. It doesn't mean that you can't fall out of fellowship with Him. But it means your salvation is secure for you are in Christ. We are saved. And I give it to them eternal life and they shall never perish. Perseverance of saints goes beyond that. Simply stated that a truly born again elect Christian will not only be saved, but they will always live with Christ as Lord and they will never fall away from the faith. And uh, so we'll, we'll get into the particulars of that as we get a little bit deeper. What is Arminianism? That was Calvinism. I know, I know there are a lot more things that Reformed theology encompasses, that Calvinism encompasses. I know there are a lot of facets and there's a lot more things. Tulip is what goes back to the root of it. These are the five points that they laid down in the 1600s that they have stood on through the years. That's why I wanted to give those. Arminianism at the same time, 1618 to 1619, came out with a five-point rebuttal of Calvinism. And I want to give you what that is, and that'll be the foundation that we've laid, and we'll go on from there. Arminianism, the first point of Arminianism, and, and I'm sorry, there's not an acrostic. Sorry, they didn't, they didn't make it easy like the tulip, okay? The Arminians apparently weren't as creative, and uh, they didn't make it uh, interesting and, and easy to remember. So you'll just have to write these down if you want to. Free will or human ability. Although human nature was seriously affected by the fall, man has not been left in a state of total spiritual helplessness. God graciously enables every sinner to repent and believe, but does not interfere with man's freedom. Each sinner possesses a free will, and his eternal destiny depends on how he uses it. Man's freedom consists in his ability to choose good over evil in spiritual matters. His will is not enslaved to his sinful nature. The sinner has the power to either cooperate or cooperate with God's spirit and be regenerated or resist God's grace and perish. So we see that is, of course, a rebuttal to uh, the total depravity or total inability. The second uh, point of Arminianism is conditional election. Uh, 
Where the other was unconditional election, this is conditional election. It says that God's choice of certain individuals unto salvation before the foundation of the world was based upon his foreseeing that they would respond to his call. He selected only those whom he knew would of themselves freely believe the gospel. Election, therefore, was determined by or conditioned upon what man would do. The faith which God foresaw and upon which he based his choice was not given to the sinner by God. It was not created by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, but resulted solely from man's will and left entirely up to man. Then the third is universal redemption. Universal redemption or general atonement says Christ's redeeming work made possible for everyone to be saved, but did not actually secure salvation for anyone. Although Christ died for all men and for every man, only those who believe on him are saved. His death enabled God to pardon sinners on the condition that they believe. But it did not actually put away anyone's sins. Christ's redemption becomes effective only if a man chooses to accept it. And that's what universal redemption or general atonement, it simply means. Now, it's stated there that, that all can be saved, but not all will be saved, that Christ died for all sin. Then the, the fourth, number four, the Holy Spirit can be effectually resisted. The Spirit calls inwardly all those who are called outwardly by the gospel invitation. He does all that he can to bring every sinner to salvation, but inasmuch as man is free, he can successfully resist the Spirit's call. The Spirit cannot regenerate the sinner until he believes faith, uh, which proceeds and makes possible the new birth. Thus, man's free will uh, limits the Spirit in the application of Christ's saving work. The Holy Spirit can only draw to Christ those who allow him to have his way with them. Until the sinner responds, the Spirit cannot give life. God's grace, therefore, is not invincible. It can be and is often is resisted and thwarted by man. So the Holy Spirit can, according to Arminianism, be effectually resisted. And then the last one is falling from grace. Uh, now, we're going to see some differences between what the Bible teaches and several of these things. One of the main facets where we're going to fall out with Arminianism is this last point. Uh, this last point, I, I just want to go ahead and say, because I don't want anybody to leave here saying, well, that, that sounds about right. I want you to know what I'm about to cover right now is dogmatically, emphatically wrong. But this is what the Arminians pose to, uh, to uh, go against or to, uh, to butt up or as a rebuttal of the perseverance of saints. They came up with falling from grace. Those who believe and are truly saved can lose their salvation by failing to keep up their faith. All Arminians have not been agreed have not been agreed on this point. Some have held that believers are eternally secure in Christ, that once a sinner is regenerated, he can never be lost. According to Arminianism, salvation is accomplished through the combined efforts of God, who takes the initiative, and man who must respond. Man's response being the determining factor. God has provided salvation for everyone, but his provision becomes effectively effective only for those who, of their own free will, chose to cooperate with him, accept his offer of grace. Now go back to our text. I've given you the, the names. I've given you the men. I've given you the doctrines in a nutshell of what each one of these believe. Uh, the, there, there are points which if taken at face or if just taken as what is said that could easily be seen in scripture. Then there are some points that you can't find in scripture anywhere. As we go through here, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I do not agree with any point of Calvinism. I do not agree with, with, with I'm not Calvinist in any form, but you will also see I am not an Arminian in any way, shape or form. I am a Bible believer. And I believe a Bible believer is what we are called to be. But go back to our text because this is one of the most controversial passages in regards to what we're dealing with tonight. And I want to deal with it for just a moment and then we'll close and, and uh, we'll look forward to the next few Sundays as we dig a little bit deeper in this. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Verse 29 is where, some, where the controversy really begins. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate Many just take it there and leave it. The Armenians took it there and left it. The Armenians said to whom he did foreknow, them he also did predestinate. And they said, all right, that simply means God looked ahead in time and everyone who would be saved, 
They are the elect. So they believe in the elect. Remember, they came out of the, the Dutch Calvinist church. They were a Dutch group of Calvinists that came out. So uh, they, they believed in the elect, but the elect were made up of those who God looked down through the channels of time and saw would be saved. So they would be. So then they're the elect. Notice what the Bible said. The Bible doesn't give us half a verse. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, whom he justified, them he also glorified. The idea of predestination here, the idea of the foreknowledge of God here is not determining if someone will be. It is determining what someone will be. God is not looking and saying, those will be saved, those will not be saved, these are the elect, these are the non-elect, these are lost, these are saved. God is saying, everyone who accepts Jesus Christ, everyone who is saved, I have predestined that person who accepts Christ to be conformed to the image of my Son. Everyone who is born again is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We have been predestined as to not if we are, but as to what we are. That is the correct, I believe, the correct interpretation of this passage of Scripture. Whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. It is not whether or not you will be saved. It is, it is already in the books what you will be once you are saved. He didn't save you and say, well... If this one turns out good in salvation, he'll be conformed to my son. If this guy turns out to be a good Christian, then he'll be one of those predestined ones that conform. No, he said everyone who is saved, everyone who comes to Jesus Christ will be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. The concept here in Romans chapter number eight, though controversial for many, because many want to try to take it as if someone will be, but it's not. It's what someone will be, and we will be conformed to the image of His dear Son. As we go through this, I, I'm asking you simply this. Uh, if you have questions or something you'd like for me to address in this or questions in regards to this, please just write them down and give them to me. I'll do my best to study them out. And I, I've said already, I know certain things. There's a lot I don't know. And there's a lot I'm looking forward to this study because I'm going to find out some things I don't know. But I do know this, starting out, I'm not Calvinist. And I'm not an Armenian. Either one. Now, I know that going into this study, so I'm not even worried about it. You say, what if you find out that, that you find out halfway through this study that you're a Calvinist? I'm not worried about that. I don't know it all, but I know enough to know I'm not going to be a Calvinist when I get done with this study. So what if, what if you find out you're an Armenian when you get done with this study? I'm not worried about that at all. I have all the peace in my heart knowing when I study this out, I am not going to be Armenian. But I will tell you this, when I come out of this study, I'm going to be a Bible believer. I'm going to stand on what God teaches about salvation. What does God teach about salvation? I'll give it to you as simply as I can right now. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every man, woman, boy, and girl, we have sinned. You have inherited sin. I talked about it recently. You were born with it. Wherefore is by one man sin entered the world, death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You have inherited sin. But guess what? You have personal sin. You have sin that you have committed yourself. It's not just something you inherited. It's something you acted out. You were born a sinner, and when you had the chance to act it out, guess what? You did. So therefore, you are guilty before God. If, you've never, if you are in your original, natural, carnal state, you are guilty before God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the Bible says this, the wages of sin is death, but thank God when He butts in. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the fact is, we're sinners, all of us. We've been, we were born sinners. We acted out sin. We, hey, it's been confirmed over and over and over. I'm a sinner. But Christ died for sinners. Amen. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible said, 
Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Jesus said, come unto me all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. John 1, 12 says, but as many received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So what does the Bible teach about salvation? The Bible teaches you're a sinner. But the Bible teaches Christ died for sinners. That means he died for you. And if Christ died for you, which he did, that means there is a way made at Calvary, but only Calvary. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Acts 4, 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the way, singular. There was a way made at Calvary. A man named Jesus Christ. So that we who were sinners could be saved. And the Bible says if we'll come to Him, if we'll place our faith in Him, if we'll receive Him, then we can be saved. It's a Bible promise. You, if you're here, you say, preacher, you don't know who all's here. Don't, I don't care. It doesn't matter who's here. If you are here and you can hear me, if you're on live stream and you can hear me, if you look up this video on YouTube and you can hear my voice, I want you to know you can be saved because Christ died for your sins. Amen. If you'll come to Christ, you can be born again and saved and know heaven is your home. Let's stand to our feet. Ashland's going to come to the piano.